Welcome back. You're watching Showdown. And I'm joined now out of Canberra by the youngest ever federal MP or state MP, I believe, in this country, White Roy, Queensland MP for Longman. Mr. Well, Mr. White Roy, Mr. Roy, thanks for your company. G'day, Peter. Thanks for having me on. Now, let me just start with, with your age. We've got some footage of, of something that probably brought you to a, a lot of attention for people uh, when you asked a, a pretty good question in Parliament. Let me just play that for you now. I'm about to turn 21. No Labor government has ever delivered a budget surplus in my lifetime. Why should anyone believe you now? Uh, you were born in 1990, um, which is freaking me out a little bit. I'm, I'm born in the 70s and I did, don't think of myself as that old. But let, 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 I won't in hold relation, that against you. <laughs> well, you. Otherwise, you'll be holding it against the other 149 of, of your colleagues on all sides of the parliament in, in, uh, in, in the House. Um, did, did you come up with that question or did the Leader's Office or, or Tactics Committee deliver it to you? No, well, um, what you would have seen at the time is that uh, myself, uh, we released a, a video outlining what has changed in the world in the last 21 years. So it was a, a conversation between Joe Hockey and I. Uh, we'd obviously talk about my 21st birthday and realised that it's been 21 years since the Labor Party have delivered a budget surplus, which is not a very good record for them. And uh, I think it'll be a significant challenge for them uh, going forward. And in terms of your age, just sticking with that before we get to some of the issues of the day, um, when you won pre-selection for your seat, I think you were 19, uh, it was during some pretty dark days for the Liberal Party and, and all the predictions then, certainly then, uh, were that you wouldn't win the seat. Now that changed dramatically as Labor's fortunes changed and, and obviously you campaigned well in the seat as well. Did you seriously think that you were a good chance of becoming an MP when you went for that pre-selection? Well, I always took the approach that uh, I was in it to win it. Uh, and I always took the approach that I was there to represent the locals in whatever capacity that would be, whether it was as a candidate or as a, as a member of the federal parliament. So uh, I think that anyone that runs for pre-selection should run with the intention of winning uh, and should run with the intention of being the best possible representative for that seat. And uh, I was very unhappy with the representation we were getting at the time. There were big local issues I was concerned about, and, and that was always my focus and still is my focus, is about giving good, effective representation to 140,000 people, making sure they have a voice... Uh, uh, at whatever level possible. Uh, just for, the, for, the, for our viewers, I was saying before we started this interview that there was some chance uh, that we would show, throw to a Sarah Hansen Young interview. We're not going to be doing that now. Uh, we're going to be sticking with this interview. I think that's probably going to help us in the ratings. We'll check that out tomorrow. But l l l let me ask you a, a, another, another question. I mean, in a sense, on, on this same theme, what about dealing with colleagues on, on both sides of the parliament? I'm not looking for a, a partisan answer here. Um, what mm. kind of barriers do you face with people that don't take you seriously because of your age? Yeah. Well, I think that it's natural to accept that people have a hesitation when, when something is different, and uh, naturally my presence here is different. Uh, but the question you have to put to yourself is, well, what do you want from a Member of Parliament or any leader? And no one ever says they want a white male aged over 55. That might be what we get more often than not, but people say they want someone that has honesty, uh, they want someone that has integrity, uh, they want someone that has an ability to listen. Uh, and I think that's what's most often forgotten politics is it is about listening more than it is about talking. And I say I've got two ears and one mouth, uh, and if you use them proportionally, you can better do your job. So at the end of the day, uh, you focus on doing your job and representing the people that uh, put their faith in you. But I have to say, I have been incredibly humbled by the support that my colleagues have given to me. You know, you said before about the question on my 21st. Well, I couldn't have done that without uh, the support of my party and particularly Joe Hockey. Uh, my colleagues have embraced the idea that uh, the parliament should be more representative of the Australian people. Uh, if you have a diversity of views when you're discussing the future of the country, that has to be a good thing for that discussion. I mean, if you have a, a shrinking gene pool in the parliament, how can that be a good thing when you're talking about the future of the country? How long do you want to be in parliament for? I mean, if you, literally, if you have a 20-year career, that's on the long side for most parliamentarians, you'd still only be 40 years of age at the end of it. How long do you see yourself being there and what kind of thing do you see yourself doing after you finish in politics? Yeah. Well, the point that I always remind people is that life is bigger than politics and there are other things out there. Uh, you know, I, I love my job. I love the fact that I can contribute and I can help people. And, and I know it's a terrible cliche, but you can make a difference. So uh, I am enjoying my job more and more each day, which is a good thing. Uh, and as long as I feel that I'm enjoying it and I'm making that contribution, I, I would like to do it. But, uh, you know, there is life outside of politics. OK, but let, let's get down to some particulars it... here. Let's get down to some particulars because you're in a marginal seat. Now, there's every chance that, mm. that you could lose that in, a, in an election where the pendulum swings against the conservative side of politics. Now, if that happened, you know, you'd, you'd still be 
potentially in your 20s, potentially in your early 30s. Do you see yourself having another crack at politics because you're so young that that's before most people would even be starting out their career? Mm. Well, I think you make a really good point. What I was about to say was there's this saying that in this job you are faced with your mortality every day. The reality is you can lose. So um, I think you just focus on doing your job. As I said, uh, with the criticism around my age, you have to do the job better than the person uh, that you're competing with uh, when you're running. So I think uh, I just you have to ground yourself in reality. You have to do your job, enjoy it. Uh, and then if there is life outside of politics afterwards, well, you know, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. But uh, I think that I am doing a good job. Uh, I enjoy it. Uh, I feel that I'm giving good representation to the locals and uh, it will always be up to them to decide my fate. I want to ask you about the idea of becoming Prime Minister. Now, most politicians will, will say, if they're being honest, that obviously, you know, you, you're not, if you're not in politics or if you're in politics, you, of course you've got that sort of a goal before you. Now, the, the challenge for you, though, is that it would be an unusual path to get there because it may well be a path that involves some time out of politics before coming back to it. For you to get to Prime Minister mm -hmm. at the sort of standard age that most people would do, even at a youthful age, which would be late 40s. You would literally have been in Parliament for nearly 30 years. Are you open to the idea of, of spending some time out of politics and then coming back? Or, or are you interested in doing things like further study or, or as a backbencher, maybe try to have some business interests on the side to broaden your interest? Just take me through it. Well, you know, you don't spend your days thinking about these things, you know, you sort of focus on the job. But um, You, uh, might, you it, must it have given some thought to it, though. A, it's a reasonable question. Uh, yeah, and, and as I said, there is another great quote that I think comes from a Labor MP. They said there's 150 members of Parliament, there's 150 Prime Ministers wanting to get out. And uh, I don't think amb ambition is a bad thing as long as it's guided by a desire to do good. But, um, you know, when you're 21 in the Federal Parliament, uh, it has never been done before. And you literally do write the rule book on, on how these things are done and how, how you approach your job. And uh, people didn't elect me to be a generic politician. People didn't say, I'm voting for a 20-year-old because I want to see, like I said, a white male aged over 55. They want to see something different and they want to see uh, you approaching things with energy and enthusiasm and, and uh, the, the characteristics that I bring to this job. So um, every day you write that rule book. And uh, as I said, I focus on doing my job. And, uh, and I think it is ultimately up to the people to decide uh, make their judgment on me and uh, over time we'll, we'll see where that goes but uh, you know as a first term opposition backbench MP uh, you are at the bottom of the uh, the pecking order in politics and uh, I, I enjoy where I'm at at the moment and you know you have to you know base yourself in reality that's my job and I I love it and I'm focused on that you haven't been there for very for very long you haven't done that many television interviews you look pretty relaxed staring down the barrel of the camera have you had media training uh, no but I threw myself in the deep end the uh, uh, when, I, when I did my first TV interview, uh, it was a press conference, uh, and uh, I tell you that is, it is nerve-wracking sitting in front of one TV camera. The first time I did it, I think there was three or four or five, and uh, you make mistakes and you learn from them. Uh, there's a great quote, again, John Howard uh, has made every mistake in politics, but he only ever made it once, and I think uh, if you can admit that you don't have all the answers, uh, you can lean on the shoulders of colleagues and other people that have had experience of this before, uh, you are better serving the people if you, if you can admit that and then learn from it. So my commitment to the people I represent is not that I will never make a mistake, it is that if I do make a mistake, I'll learn from that experience so that I can better represent them. Do you consider the following quote a mistake? I, I had a bit of a crack at you at the time, I think, in, in an article that I wrote, a quote that you gave to the, the Weekend I, I Australian. I know what the quote is that you're going to say. Yeah, you know where I'm coming from. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a big reader. I like to learn by yeah. experience. Now, maybe there was more context to that, but at face value, that's one of those quotes yeah. that you look at, delivered by a young person, you think, well, that's a, a kind sure. of silly thing to say. Sure, and, and as you said, you learn from those experiences. Uh, that was quite taken out of context, and I think that the journalists at the time had a agenda that they were pursuing but you know our, our job as politicians is not to judge the media it is to articulate the things we want to do so uh, I learned from that experience I do read quite a lot I think the point I was more making is you know it, it's not like me to sit down and read a you know a fiction book I more read you know biographies and uh, those sorts of things and uh, obviously I didn't get that message across it made a great quote and a great news story um, but, uh, you know, at the end okay, of the well, day, well, we let, 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 let me test the proposition then. I'm not, I'm not going to give you a pop quiz on the book, don't worry, but I understand that Tony Abbott gave yeah. you a copy of Robert Menzies' memoir uh, in the party got, room. Yeah. Is that right? And, and have you started reading it or indeed finished reading it? Absolutely. Well, yeah, I have certainly read a lot of uh, Menzies' things. Judith Brett is a great commentator on the Liberal Party as well, and she's spoken a lot about uh, Menzies. But, uh, you know, I, I sort of find my political 
uh, home or my philosophical home in, in the philosophy that Menzies articulated of about empowering people, of, about imp providing freedom of choice, about giving people opportunity. And, and the best thing that you can do for people in society is give them a hand up instead of a handout. And I think that, uh, you know, certainly I've, I've looked at a lot of what Menzies has said because, uh, you know, I come from a Labor family traditionally. I found myself in the, in the Liberal Party because I have a real commitment and belief to that philosophy of empowering people and giving people freedom of choice. OK, let, let me test you on a, on a couple of policy areas. Uh, start with the asylum seekers. Uh, well, I guess the tragedy today. Now, I know that neither the government nor the opposition want to turn this into a political issue. Now is not the time or the place for it. Scott Morrison yeah. has made that quite clear. Um, but how committed are you to a tough border protection policy? And I ask this in the context of a lot, a, a lot of young people uh, are probably more yeah. likely to be, uh, you know, to perhaps be uh, less strong about this than, than people as they get older. Yeah, well, I think Scott does make a good point about uh, that today is probably not the best time to be having that debate. Uh, and I remember I did a, a TV interview after the Christmas Island tragedy uh, and to the... Um, frustration of the journalists, I made that point again. But, but let, me, let me answer your question. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, I do not think it is humane as a nation uh, to have a set of policies, or in the case of the current government, a lack of policies, uh, which encourages people to spend tens of thousands of dollars to risk their life to come to this country. Now, regardless of what your views are on our policy, uh, we had a policy where there were three boat arrivals a year, we're seeing now on average more than three a week and that's a lot of people out there paying a lot of money to risk their life and uh, from that perspective uh, I think that is what we should be doing as a government. We should be uh, making sure that uh, we are not encouraging people to, to do that, to go on that process. OK, let me ask you about the Qantas dispute. The Labor Party was attacking Tony Abbott saying that he wasn't prepared to have a crack at Qantas for what it did you know, as, as, in a negative way. Are you prepared to have a crack at them? What do you think of their actions? Do you think they're justifiable or well, do you think that they were extreme? Well, well I think you, you missed the point here. The Labor Party are having a go at Qantas rather than talking about what they should be no, doing. No, no, I accept, I accept, I accept interest, all of that, but, but, but I want to I yeah. stick on the question. Let's stick on the question. Do you yeah. think that what Qantas but, did... Well, I mean, I'll tell you what I think. I think it was reasonable what Qantas did. That was my editorial mm. at the top of the program. Do you think it was reasonable yeah. what they did or do you think that it was a bit over the top? Well, our job as politicians is not to pick sides in disputes, it's to facilitate a discussion that will resolve that dispute. And th this afternoon you would have seen Qantas come out and said uh, that uh, if the government had have enacted Section 431 of the Act, the Act that Julia Gillard wrote, uh, that they would have not grounded the fleet. So, I mean, you can have a hypothetical well, debate. Let, let, but sorry, Mr Roy, day, let, me, let me just exist. jump in because they've decided they do want to hear what Sarah Hansen-Young says. Just Quite stay with us and we'll come back to exactly where we're, where we're uh, talking. Occurring off Terrian intake. That was Green Senator Sarah Hanson Young. You can continue watching that press conference if you're sort of odd uh, by going into Multiview. Uh, that that option is there for you. Um, White Roy, we're, we're, we're almost out of time now as, as a result of that interlude. But but if I could just maybe return to the asylum seekers issue with with one last question and more a reaction to this sort of Greens notion mm. that uh, that onshore processing is okay despite these sort of tragedies because the way to the way to go is essentially to try to significantly increase the quota and then that will uh, put downward pressure on on the number of people that try to get here illegally by boats. How do you react to that? Well, I obviously don't agree with it. I think uh, you have to remember people smuggling is a multi-million dollar industry uh, and there is a product to be sold, uh, which is permanent residency here or permanent uh, uh, presence in Australia. And uh, with the lack of the policies that the current government has, you have to remember they've gone through East Timor, they've gone to Malaysia, they've lost complete and utter control. You are encouraging people, uh, you are encouraging the people smugglers uh, to sell a product uh, that people pay tens of thousands of dollars for. Uh, and end up risking their life on that journey. So I do not believe it is a humane thing to do uh, to be in the situation where we are now, where we are saying to people smugglers, send people down uh, and, and risk their life on that process. That is, I don't think that's what we should be doing as a government or as a country. All right, White Row, we are out of time. We appreciate you joining us on Showdown. Hopefully we'll be able to get you on, uh, on a Sky program again soon and, and discuss some wider issues uninterrupted by the Greens. Appreciate your company. Great, Peter. Thanks for having me on. When we